This morning, we're going to turn a little bit more directly into a conversation about faith and about polarization and our national moment. And I, I think you're really going to enjoy uh, the conversation that's on deck uh, with Michael Ware and, and John Ward. I think John Ward has done four Substack pieces on Michael's book and a podcast, which is itself sort of a Substack as well. So a lot of interaction. He really knows it and they're friends and that's going to come out. Um, but our, our idea is to sort of talk a little bit about the state of our politics today uh, with um, kind of renewal and personal renewal and some ideas from Dallas Willard in, in mind, um, in part because Michael published in early 2024 a book called The Spirit of Our Politics, um, Spiritual Formation and the Renovation of Public Life. And the year before that, John Ward published uh, in 2023 a book called Testimony um, Inside the Evangelical uh, Movement that failed a generation and uh, talks about his own interaction <clears throat> with evangelicalism, with a, a church just north of the, of the city, and uh, his life as a journalist and how that kind of all syncs up. And they are outstanding books, and I recommend them wholeheartedly. Um, but basically, we want to ask whether, you know, right now religion drives our polarization or could help provide some solution to it. Um, and it's a complicated answer. Both speakers will, will speak from themes in their respective books. Um, John's book in 2023, Testimony, considers some of the th same themes that Michael's does, just from a different angle. Um, and in some sense, each of these thinkers and journalists uh, are arguing that the, the best way to transcend our polarized political morass is to deepen and revitalize our own spiritual formation through renewed commitment, uh, better faith uh, uh, that, 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 um, that leads to something beyond our current moment, which does feel like the end of something. Uh, rather than the, the beginning of something. Uh, so let me introduce him briefly. Michael Ware uh, was in the Obama faith-based office. Um, he has written two books. Uh, the earlier one was called Reclaiming Hope, Lessons Learned from the Obama White House about the future of faith in America. And of course, this one, he's also the founder and president and CEO of the Center for Christianity and Public Life, which is a nonprofit nonpartisan institution in the, in the nation's capital that tries to contend for the credibility of Christian resources and public life for the public good, for the common good. Um, he's written a lot else, a uh, book with John, just, just, me, Justin Gibney called Compassion and Conviction, uh, inside the AND campaign's uh, sort of guide to faithful civic engagement. He's written in a lot of big outlets that a lot of you have written into, and his full bio is in the, in the program. Uh, John Ward is the chief national Correspondent for Yahoo News. He is the uh, author of this book from Brazos Press. He's also the author of Camelot's End, uh, Kennedy versus Carter, and the fight that broke the Democratic Party from, 2009, from 20, 2019. Uh, he hosts the Long Game podcast, which incidentally is how I kind of came to, to sort of love journalism. About seven or eight years ago when he launched it and I was working at a foundation in Wisconsin, I started listening in the cornfields and it just pulled you back, it pulled me back. Um, it's a great podcast, I recommend it heartily. Uh, he's been at this work for uh, just over two decades as a city desk reporter in DC, as a White House correspondent who traveled Air Force One uh, all over the world, as a national affairs correspondent who's traveled the country to write about two different presidential campaigns and the ideas and anim people animating our times. His work, too, has been published broadly, um, as you can see in the longer form bio in your program. And you know, basically, we've asked them to talk about where we are, uh, about what you've sort of seen over the last couple of decades, about the uniqueness of this moment, and about what we can do about it. And our thinking is that John is going to say a few words to start us off, and then he is going to have a conversation with Michael, drawing out some themes from this new book. John. Yeah, I'm going to be very brief. Uh, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, it's great to be here this morning after dinner last night. I just want to affiliate myself with um, Carl's comments from last night. Uh, Michael, you weren't there, but Carl Cannon gave uh, a really nice toast to Michael Cromarty and everyone else uh, involved with Faith Angle at the beginning, um, on to Josh and Nicole and EPPC and the work that they're doing now. <clears throat> for me, having been involved with Faith Angle now for a number of years, it was a nice moment to sort of sit back and think about the impact over time um, that <clears throat> an institution can have. Um, and, and that actually connects to the very short comment I was going to make about Michael before I launch into questions, which is that um, one of the things I wrote 
um, on Substack about, I think when I wrote about why I'm reading the, why I was reading the book, is I wrote, social media and celebrity don't create sustained movement toward a goal. Influencers are ephemeral because they are individuals. People's capacities and purposes ebb and flow. Institutions endure beyond one person. Institutions can be created around a vision, a goal, a theme, a set of ideas, and can organize and mobilize groups of individuals towards achieving that vision. Um, you know, Michael and I have connected over this idea of institutions for several years now. Um, that was a question I took up after the 2016 election um, and have been sort of exploring, in, in, you know, over the, over the years. Uh, Michael was a huge encourager of that, but, you know, what year was it that you founded CCPL? Was that last year? Yeah, so a year and change ago, Michael started an institution called the Center for Christianity and Public Life. I'm never quite sure whether it's and or in, right? Uh, it's and. Yeah, all right. Um, and so he's putting his money where his mouth is, starting an institution. Uh, the, the mission uh, or the function of CCPL is twofold, and this is from their website. It explains Christianity to the public and advances Christian resources for the good of the public, and then it is working to grow, support, convene, and represent the community of Christians who are convinced of the centrality of spiritual formation for civic renewal. Um, I will get to a question, a few questions in about uh, people of faiths other than Christianity, because there's a lot of Christian in that rhetoric. Um, I'll get to that. But I wanted to start, Michael, um, by asking you, about this idea of this word formation, um, I have noticed, and I'm I'm curious whether you think like this is just me or whether this is something broader. A lot of conversation about um, formation, whether you're talking about religion or politics um, or culture. Do you agree that this is this topic of formation has become uh, something that's more on the minds of people over the last? number of however many years. If so, uh, why? what would you attribute that to? Yeah. Well, first, really good to be with all of you. Wish I could have been with you uh, last night, but I just just flew in this morning. Thank you, Josh, Nicole, uh, for, for the invitation. And John, it's always good, to, always good to talk with you. And so many of you, I read your work, uh, everything you write, and others. I'm really excited to meet you and, and learn more about you. Um, I do think that there is a resurgence, uh, uh, upswell of conversation about, about formation, particularly in connection to public life politics. I think it reflects a few things. First, just uh, uh, a growing sort of ecumenical sort of thrust behind faith and politics sort of conversation. So formation. Uh, is something that's salient across Christian denominations, but also outside of that. Um, and there's a lot we could say about, well, well, why is the conversation becoming more ecumenical? I mean, one, one thing to say is that with declining religious attendance, with the rise of religiously disaffiliated folks, I think that religious questions in this country are going to become a lot more fundamental and sort of uh, less, uh, less sectarian. So that's the first thing to say. The second thing is I think our politics has just uh, 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 made it really clear how important uh, character and formation is to public leadership. Uh, this has, um, there have been voices who have been attentive to these issues. I think of the work of like James Davison Hunter, for instance, who's written for, for a while about uh, character, public life, education. Um, I think what's, what's happened is on the left, uh, uh, as a reaction to Trump, formation has become salient in a way um, that now I think spans uh, the, the uh, partisan divide in an interesting way. And then finally, I'd just say, you know, there's been theological development on the question. So there is within evangelicalism in particular, which 
for reasons you are all familiar with, um, uh, uh, punches above its weight uh, in terms of the national conversation about faith, uh, faith and politics. Evangelicalism, there's been a rise uh, of conversation about spiritual formation. What does it have to do with the gospel? Is spiritual formation essential or just a nice add-on? Um, there are a lot of voices who have contributed to this. Dallas Willard is, is one of the primary voices. So just a brief word on Willard. Willard was a uh, professor of philosophy at University of Southern California at, uh, for almost 50 years. For a time, he was chair of that department. Uh, he also was a pastor, Christian author, teacher at various stages in his life. He was uh, an early evangelical voice in sort of the modern iteration around spiritual formation, or some would call it uh, discipleship. And the, the new book is, is an application of Willard's ideas to our politics and public life. Um, you know, I, I'm, I, I don't want to hold us up too much, but I, mm. it did catch my attention that you said, like, you feel like there's been more discussion of formation on the left in response to mm. Trump. Can you just uh, unpack that just real quickly? What do you mean by that? Yeah, I mean, so... Um, in his book, uh, Audacity of Hope, uh, Barack Obama interestingly writes about uh, Alan Keyes confronting him in, uh, in their debate for the Senate race there in 2004. And uh, Keyes said something around, uh, something like, you know, Jesus Christ would not vote for Barack Obama. Uh, and Barack Obama responded, you know, we're electing a sender. Uh, 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 representing Illinois, not a minister. And that has, was like standard and, and still is standard sort of democratic um, rhetoric. Now, a, a, a few interesting things happened. One, Donald Trump uses the exact same phrase and people, and people supporting Donald Trump use the same phrase within religious communities. They'll right. say, yes, he's not a perfect man, but we're electing uh, a president, not a pastor. The flip side of what happened was all of a sudden, progressives were telling evangelicals, hey, why aren't you applying your faith to politics? After 50 years of telling evangelicals, hey, don't impose your values on our politics, all of a sudden, Trump rises up and it's, it's hey, he doesn't match your morality. He doesn't... Um, it's it's a very interesting turn, and I'd say something we could is how discombobulating and sort of disorienting that that is. There is a way of looking at evangelical support for Trump as a sort of concession uh, to calls for liberalization, separation of church and state, uh, real politic that evangelicals were criticized for decades of rejecting. Think of like Thomas Frank's analysis. Uh, they, they reject their personal interests in favor of these values. Well, now all of a sudden, Democrats were saying, hey, where are your values? Um, uh, and so, 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 yeah, that's part of the, part of the scene that's, that's happening. I'll also just say, right, like a lot of the, the intra-religious, particularly among conservatives, not just evangelicals, but Catholics and others, uh, right, has been about how much does character matter? There's been a lot of criticism of Al Mohler, for instance, who is the head of the largest uh, uh, seminary in the country, um, who, you know, people will do side-by-sides of his rhetoric regarding Bill Clinton and the Lewinsky scandal and yeah. sort of how he's rationalized coming around eventually to support for Trump. And, and these are real internal conversations. Does character matter? How? How do you balance character with, with policy implications? So um, the title of Michael's book is The Spirit of Our Politics, Spiritual Formation, and the Renovation of Public Life. You talk in this book about Christian politics. Uh, can you briefly des describe what that term means? What is a Christian mm -hmm. politics? And why is understanding that term and that reality important for those who are members of other faiths or no faith? Yeah, well, right, the very practical answer is uh, we live in a country uh, where a, a solid majority of American voters identify as Christian. And so the shape of 
the church, the, sh the shape of sort of the public expressions of Christianity have a great deal to do with the shape of democracy and the shape of, of this country. Um, when I refer to a Christian politics, and, and sometimes there are different, different settings and different ways of using that term, I mean, the, the base level is just um, uh, uh, what, uh, how do Christians express themselves and act um, politically? And part of what I'm trying to do is, in, a, in some segments, politics has become this area that is sort of cordoned off from God and cordoned off from sort of the kind of person Christians are. So because there's such low esteem for politics, generally, but among Christians uh, as well, there is this kind of idea that develops that, uh, well, of course, politics is going to be corrupt. Of course, politics is going to be a place for anger and fear, manipulation and deceit. That's what politics is. And so, I'm, uh, uh, you know, uh, the politics is not even a place to live out one's Christian faith. Uh, 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 politics can become a place where you go to secure your own personal self-interest so that maybe you can follow Jesus in your personal life. Uh, I'm trying to ask questions about, uh, no, actually, there is no political you. There's just you. Uh -huh. If you are the kind of person who lies in the middle of a political argument to get your way, uh, you are the kind of person who lies in the political argument to get your way. Um, uh, spiritual formation, which simply refers to the, the process by which the, the, your will takes on a specific shape or character. So everyone has a spiritual formation. Um, you, don't, you don't opt into spiritual formation. Everyone has one because everyone has a will. Everyone uh, has a character. You know, um, uh, that is operative in politics. Uh, and, and, and so I'm trying to force some of these conversations about well, how, how do Christians show up in politics? And, and to, to boil it down, I argue that politics is an essential form in which uh, we can ought to love our neighbor, to will their good. If a Christian's politics is not oriented towards willing the good of even their political enemies, uh, their politics is not Christian in its character. Um, is it fair to say that you're advocating within a pluralist mindset for what Christianity can contribute? to yes. that conversation about uh, the shape of our politics, the moral shape of our politics? Yes, that is very much um, what I'm seeking to do. And, and I only ask that because the, the sections about moral knowledge could be taken by some to say, well, moral knowledge infers or, or demands action. And so my moral knowledge is you know, such and such in a way that could, could mm -hmm. seek to run over others' moral, other, others moral claims. Yeah, no, I mean, but, but I think we can't ignore, um, everyone is operating on knowledge, whether they acknowledge, whether they acknowledge it or not. Um, and I think that uh, we don't do ourselves any favors by sort of trying to preempt or prohibit or sort of wave away that that is what we're doing. That, that there is, um, uh, that our politics is about anything but that. Mm -hmm. uh, wh wh what, what I'm arguing for is, um, look, the, the beauty and weakness of our democracy is that it can't get around the kind of people we are. Um, the state of our politics reflects the state of our souls. It reflects what we, what we bring to it. And, and it's been astounding, the sort of testimonies from elected officials. I mean, if you look at the statements from members of Congress that have retired, which we have a very significant round of retirements this cycle, um, their uh, observations about their time in service are getting more and more blunt, more and more direct. We had Senator Coons at our summit last year, and Senator Coons was very clear. Y yes, elected officials need to act um, with courage, 
Uh, but repeated acts of courage in politics, uh, we have another term for that, and it's called unemployment. Mm. You know, like, um, we need to face the fact that the reason why we call these what seem to many of us to be simple acts of stating the truth to be acts of courage is because stating the truth is disincentivized by people, mm -hmm. uh, including many Christians. And, and, and that can't just be hand waved away as well, that's politics and people are going to, uh, no, we need to, we need to have conversations about the kind of people we are and what that has to do with the kind of politics we have. In some ways, we could have an argument about, I would like to get rid of party primaries. You would like to go into the party primary electorate and, <laughs> and, and help, help them vote in different ways. Um, you know, um, one of the entry points for your book is President Kennedy's yeah. uh, speech in 1960, where he talks about his relationship with the Catholic Church and tries to uh, put to bed fears about yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, how much the Pope and the Vatican would influence his decision making when if he were elected. Um, you write that um, that speech was interpreted, whether or not he meant it as such, as calling for a total exclusion of religious influence in political affairs. Can you talk a little bit about that and then also tease out the difference between what you're advocating for uh, instead of that, instead of a total exclusion mm. of religious influence and political affairs. Yeah. That's what you're advocating for, but tease out the difference between that and what others mean yeah. when they say, you know, per David Barton, yeah. that the separation yeah. of church and state <laughs> is not in the Constitution and we shouldn't abide by that. Yeah, sure. Where are you, where are you landing here? Yeah, so <clears throat> this is in a chapter on an idea called the disappearance of moral knowledge. And this is Willard's concept, probably the, the, his principal academic contribution He's basically referring to uh, in the post-World War II period, and this is sort of his terminology, gatekeepers of knowledge, principally academia, but also others, decided that and acted as, as if moral knowledge, knowledge about good and evil, knowledge about right and wrong, is not publicly available knowledge. It is not fit to be taught from institutions of knowledge. Who is driving this primarily in your in your view? So so this is so this is really important. So this is a very different um, this is a very different concept than uh, sort of some of the hand wringing about uh, cultural decline or especially these narratives of sort of an imposition from the outside onto like the American people. Willard is very clear, no, this actually emerges in part because of the contribution of an acquiescence of Christians uh, and of, of a, that these are historical and philosophical de developments over time. So for instance, and I, I highlight some of the arguments in, my, uh, in the book, but like one of the principal reasons this developed is because of the vast misuse of moral claims as a way to oppress people mm -hmm. and as a way to manipulate people. And as the moral knowledge came to be, be viewed as just one other form of like a power play. Mm -hmm. And so, so, so the, 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 this, the, the reference to Kennedy comes in the midst of, of, of this, this chapter. Um, and uh, yeah, it was a pivotal moment that I think still has ripples throughout our politics. I, I think it's difficult to, um, uh, difficult to overstate how salient Kennedy's experience and the way that he navigated sort of the, the political predicament that he was in, how much it shaped an entire generation, and I'd, I'd argue like, like uh, uh, preceding generations, in which he, he basically was in one of the ironies of, of history, right? He's, uh, he appears in front of the Houston Ministerial Alliance to tell them that his faith won't have undue sort of influence on his on his politics, on his presidency, right. on his decision making, um, and it like it, he was very clearly motivated by political and electoral needs and cultural needs. There was a lot of uh, anti-Catholic uh, 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 sentiment in America uh, at the time. Um, but what that meant was there was a sort of 
because of the political motivation, we, we had a kind of moment of consensus in American life that this is how people of faith ought to act. Mm. That faith, faith ought not and is not fit to guide decision making. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, he'd go to make arguments for the nuclear test ban treaty and martial religious rhetoric and language for that. Right. I mean, uh, there's uh, the Civil Rights Act uh, and his, his push for civil rights. Uh, uh, he would marshal religious arguments for that. So he wasn't even entirely consistent with some interpretations of his remarks. But it did send a message. It sent a message about the right place of religion in public life. Um, Willard thought that the separation of church and state should be zealously upheld as a legal principle. Uh, and I agree. I mean, part of my responsibility in the, in the Obama White House was, uh, was that. And I believe in the separation of church and state as a legal principle. Uh, rooted, rooted in the First Amendment? Rooted in the First Amendment. Right. Um, rooted in constitutional prohibitions against religious tests for office. That's, uh -huh. that's kind of um, I, I think what is becoming clear is that there is a, there can be a philosophical thrust which seems to accompany the legal principle of separation of church and state, mm. which can be summarized as sort of the disappearance of moral knowledge. That mm. right separation of, of church and state is is uh, primarily about institutional prohibitions, right. but when you when you enforce that institutionally. You have to have a very uh, a clear philosophical delineation about the reasons for doing that and what that doesn't mean about the value of religious or moral knowledge, which are not synonymous. But um, uh, uh, and 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 that that creates, I think, real problems and inconsistencies. And and uh, my former boss Barack Obama called it a practical absurdity. Um, he gave a speech in two thousand six where he said that um, uh, 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 sort of strict church state separationists and, and sort, of, sort of activists were wrong to ask people of faith to leave their faith outside the door of their politics. He said it was a practical absurdity. Law, uh, lawmaking is by definition um, uh, about, about judgments, about morality, he said. And he said, imagine trying to strip out religious influence from American history. William Jennings Bryan, Dorothy Day, the Civil Rights Movement, like, like uh, Lincoln's second inaugural. He said, he, 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 you know, he, he said so much of uh, that which we extol and lift up is, is unthinkable without religious influence. And so, um, you, you know, my... my, my um, I think we need to reclaim moral knowledge as a category. And I will say, I think we're seeing some of that. I mean, I, I've been conservative. My conservative friends are uh, very worried about, you know, the rhetoric about sort of alternative ways of knowing. And you're seeing this in, in some academic institutions. And I think that some of those ideas could, could, could go down directions that aren't helpful. But I have a more positive take. I think these are sort of uh, uh, cracks, uh, uh, what, what Charles Taylor uh, would call sort of a cracks in the secular, sort of sort of cracks in a in a oppressive um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, sort of discourse that doesn't have any room for transcendence or for mm -hmm. alternative ways of knowing, mm -hmm. and I'm seeing that open up. Um, I, I think you see it when you have rising public policy discussions about things like loneliness mm -hmm. and social meaning. Mm. Uh, these are things that, I mean, we could try and test them. And there, there are a lot of people that, you know, uh, who are the Harvard Human Flourishing Project, which does excellent work. And there are people trying to put numbers around this. But these are, these are uh, not merely technical and scientific questions, but questions about, about meaning, about the human person. And if our politics doesn't have room, and, and more broadly, our public square doesn't have room for these conversations to uh, be taken seriously, then no wonder why so many people feel estranged from our politics, because it doesn't map on to, to their, their experience. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but um, just real quickly, like, what would you say to somebody who said, 
uh, separation of, of church and state is not in the Constitution. And, and they're reacting to you know, the, the David Barton argument from the right that it came from the letter to the Danbury Baptists and yeah, yeah, yeah. like all that. Yeah, I mean, so, uh, so I mean, they're right in a technical sense. The right. phrase does not appear. Um, what does appear is uh, free exercise uh, um, and, uh, and uh, the Establishment Clause. Right. And so, like, oh, okay, if you don't want to, like, if you want to, if you want to say this, the, the phrase separation, of, okay, well, the separation of church and state is essentially meant to uh, describe a, 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 a patchwork uh, 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 of constitutional law uh, that covers how religion and the state ought to interact. So, uh, you know, these are these can get into silly season sort of semantic battles. But but one of the reasons it does so is because I think the idea of the separation of church and state is wielded so carelessly by right. so many, so that any. It, whenever right. religion is raised in a way that's inconvenient, th there's a move to say, hey, you're, you're in violation of the separation of church and state here. Right. Uh, when the person is saying, no, no, I'm just, I'm just participating in democracy. I'm, I'm stating what I believe and why I believe it. That's not prohibited <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, in, 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 in general. Um, and so, um, so there, there's a lot of foul play um, at this uh, uh, at this set of issues, um, uh, you know, to go around. Yeah, I think people who are resonating with that argument about you know pushing back against the separation right. of church. Sometimes they'll be portrayed as if oh they're arguing for you know theocracy or uh, Christian nationalism, and th there are certainly elements of that out there. But I think a lot of times there's also just a instinctive reaction to what happened after that Kennedy speech, which was a, a pushing out of the, from the public square of moral knowledge, uh, of you know, re religious principles and values that can be incorporated into policy making. And I do think like the, there's a really important conversation going on about um, whether government can be neutral about liberalism. I mean, I do think there's been criticism of, you know, the final third of Deneen's Deneen's book, but I think there's a reason, you know, Barack Obama put it on his whatever his summer reading list, or because because there there's a conversation being had that if progressives in particular aren't attentive to it, they're just going to be missing out on huge undercurrents in our politics. That it's so important. It's not just white evangelicals having these conversations, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and yet we can so so uh, uh, quickly, uh, I think, reduce these questions to being the parochial interest of uh, you know of, of a of a narrow set of Republican politicians, and then Democrats wonder or media voices wonder why there's a um, again an estrangement. From a broad set of constituencies, and it and it's because these questions actually aren't as parochial as sometimes we make them out to be. Yeah, uh, you talk. We've already talked a lot about moral knowledge. Um, can you distinguish quickly between uh, moral knowledge and sort of this idea of public knowledge, which Jonathan Rauch talks about uh, in his book, The Constitution of Knowledge? How would you? What's the overlap, and what's how would you contrast and compare those two terms? Um, so moral knowledge is about, is about reality and doesn't want to be about anything other than that. I, I think, um, I think moral knowledge is a separate category from sort of the scientific. So, so moral knowledge can't always be, uh, replicated in closed environment sort of testing. But let me give you an example of moral knowledge. So I, I, I was on the Hill a couple months ago, made an argument about, uh, to, I was talking to uh, 100 Hill staffers or so, and was making an argument about our, our, too, our too high esteem for anger and what we think it can accomplish for us in our politics. Um, th there is certainly scientific data that I can and do draw upon to make that argument. 
But I don't think the scientific argument sort of, I think if you just want to argue on the basis of science that question, mm -hmm. then I think it's a jump ball. Um, I, I, you know, I, 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 I don't think everything that you need to marshal that argument is, is there. But I was drawing on wisdom of philosophers throughout the ages. I was drawing on scripture to make that argument. I was drawing on people's own experience with anger in their own lives, asking people to consider uh, uh, how, how often their experiments with anger and trying to leverage it for their own purposes, how often those actually went to plan. Um, uh, that is an example of moral knowledge. Okay. I, I think a lot of the conversation that we're having right now about forgiveness in public life or grace in public life, I think of Liz Bruning's um, series of essays on, on forgiveness, I think in 2022, she, she is doing moral knowledge. Um, she's advancing moral knowledge. Um, I, you know, uh, John Roush is a friend. Um, I, I don't, I, I don't want to sort of speculate. And we haven't had this conversation in particular mm -hmm. about, uh, about his, his idea of, of public knowledge. I do think I'd push back against sort of scientism mm -hmm. or empiricism, sort of th these ideas that the, the only thing that's fit for public discourse is that, mm -hmm. Uh, that which can be put on in a spreadsheet mm. um, uh, uh, again because what what happens is then moral arguments gets get trafficked in through the data so so people uh, w w what are um, mm. I a lot of sort of Christian discourse um, remains stuck in the 90s, focused on conversations about relativism. Uh, I, I've argued, uh, if you think, like, relativism is dead, like, look around. Uh, uh, like, relativism is not the future. It's not even the present. Our public square is full of moral assertions. What our public square lacks is a sense of moral authority. Mm. Like, one of the reasons why you see ever-escalating sort of anxiety and franticness and belligerence in our public discourse is because people are trying to um, muster up authority through a sort of a um, motive uh, 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 performance because they're, they're worried that there's actually nothing at the foundation of what they're actually, what they're actually advancing, um, th that their moral assertions don't have any any moral authority that can be poked at and and uh, pressed on and tested, and that can be at least hypothetically acknowledged by a diverse group of people. Um, I'm going to go to Q and A in just a minute. I do hope somebody asks about how we get to consensus on moral, what is moral authority when you have mm -hmm. competing claims. Um, just real quickly, though, I wanted to ask you about your mention of the British model. Uh, this really intrigued me in the book. You talk about, you know, they have an established church. Uh, you talk about that admirably, um, you know, and you talk about the marketplace approach to religion in America yeah. as having certain downsides. Yeah. Um, you know, where would you land on that? Are you, I don't think you're advocating for, no, for an no, establishment, no, no. but kind of talk about no, what you were yeah. trying to communicate there. Well, so I just, I just got back from London, actually. Yeah. Um, and... Look, I mean, it's, it's uh, so yeah, I'm not advocating to, to replicate that model. Here's what I would say. I do think that establishment looks different. Um, I, I think that there are different arguments to be made about establishment in a uh, culture where religion is flourishing um, and what establishment does uh, in a society where religion is in decline. So, so I, I think, right, there's, um, I think, something like 10% of Brits attend church or, or a house of worship regularly. Mm. Um, and yet, yeah, right, there's something interesting. We see the coronation. And there, there's a, or uh, two trips to London ago. Now, when I was in London, the Archbishop Welby, who's a member of the House of Lords, uh, uh, mm -hmm. once a year leads debate in the House of Lords. And 
he doesn't get to dictate what other people are saying, but he gets to set the terms. And, and the question he asked were, what are British values? And so for the rest of the day, for the rest of that session in the House of Lords, there was a conversation, mm. a pluralistic, mutual conversation about <coughs> what are British values in, in the modern age. I do think there's, there's, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a health to that. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a sense of like, um, you know, a kind of backstop. The, 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 whereas now I think part of why uh, I, I think that um, one of the reasons why you have constituencies that are vulnerable to uh, narratives of embattlement and fear um, uh, it, it is because they're able to say, like, there's nothing here but raw political power based on winning elections. And you lose enough elections and you'll be erased and you won't have a place in public life. And, uh, uh, you know, as Donald Trump would say, right, like, um, look at ISIS is beheading Christians, uh, and look what they're doing to Christians here in America. Vote for me, you know, like that. Like that. That's the logic model that, that Trump had. Um, so again, I, I, it's not a point of overemphasis. Part of what I'm doing in that section is just pushing back on some of I think the American arrogance that um, uh, that we have the the very best model for promoting religion in society, and we have a thriving marketplace of ideas. And what I argue in the book is, um, or at least I, I raise the question, I don't even make an extended argument, um, but it, maybe we do have a marketplace of religion and um, it's doing what marketplaces do, which is not necessarily uh, elevating the better angels of our nature, but actually playing to some of the uh, worst instincts that we that we have and I could talk a lot more about that I mean I think I, I, I write about this term political therapeutic deism um, in in the book which is essentially the leveraging of religious imagery and ideas as a supplemental support a, a kind of divine affirmation for one's politics uh, I think we're seeing you know quite quite a bit of that and that's that's not unrelated to the the idea of a, of a marketplace of religious ideas. Just the last thing I'd, I'd say here is, you know, I think Tim Alberta's reporting um, has been helpful um, and, and uh, has been helpful in what I call uh, politics sensitive churches, which is a riff off in, in the 80s and 90s, there was an evangelical movement around seeker sensitive churches, mm. which meant that churches were being set up to reach people who were outside the faith. and. Um, uh, uh, services, market, everything was supposed to be oriented towards bringing people in. Um, I argue in the book that we're seeing in some sectors, this isn't everywhere, but the rise of politics sensitive churches where churches are organizing themselves around either appealing to a particular political type or setting themselves up to, to sort of in rejection to or opposition to a particular kind of, kind of ideology. And that didn't seem to exist before relatively recently as Tim draws out in the book. By the way, um, Michael and Tim have two podcasts that they do with us. One focused on Tim Alberta's book and one uh, Kingdom Town of Glory and then one on, on Michael's books. They sort of flip roles and explore the others. And I want to ask one question by way of follow-up to something John just asked, which is about how does this matter to us? Yeah. I mean, this is probably uh, yesterday and today, this session, that's the closest thing to church mm. that we're doing. Okay, mm -hmm. so... Uh, does the formation uh, of journalists matter in some way, too? If the formation of, of our politics, uh, if, the, if the sort of spiritual condition of our politics matters, and you talk about the book, what about its application to us? Yeah. As, I, as I look around um, sort of Faith Angles Network, there are some people. John is one of them. Yeah. Uh, Pete Wainer, who was here yesterday, is one of them. Uh, the late Mike Gerson was one of them. Liz Bruning is one of them. Yeah. David Brooks is one of them, who have a effort at fostering some kind of spiritual integrity. It doesn't mm. have to necessarily be Christian. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't have, but, but, but there's an effort at it. Does that matter in what people are able to produce as sort of the prophets of our time? Oh, and okay. then let's flip yeah. to the group, because we got a lot of smart people in this room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A great deal. It matters a, it matters a great deal. Um, 
So organizationally, we run a, a program called Public Life Fellowship Program. Um, and a Young Professionals Network. Journalists are a part of that program. John serves as a mentor in the program, but we have fellows who are journalists. We have members of our Young Professionals group that are journalists. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, you know better than, better than anyone that the kinds of, I mean, sometimes it's just very practical. How do you treat sources? Mm -hmm. how, 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 you know that there are have you ever been uh, in an interview where the person you're talking to says something and you go, gosh, I could write exactly what they said. I know they didn't mean it the way it would be received, but I could report exactly what they said and it, it, would, it would get me some clicks. It, it, it could be a big story. But you know that, it, that that wasn't what they were saying. Well, that's a real, that could be a real vocational crisis. Um, and it, it gets very easy to sort of rationalize. Um, well, they said it, they should have been on their game. Like, and you know, maybe they didn't mean it, but they align themselves with people who do mean it that way. And so, you know, really I'm helping to tell like a broader story and like they just happen to be in the wrong place at the right, at the wrong time talking to me. <laughs> um, and those, and so, those choices accrue. Oh, absolutely. And yeah. yeah, and then once you're on that track, the, right, this is what happens, you, you, right? It, you make one decision like that, and then all of a sudden, um, it becomes what you're known for. Right. And, and you gain traction that way. And you, well, now I'm set here. Well, maybe when I become editor-in-chief, then I'm going to put in place a new system mm -hmm. so that the incentive structure is different. Mm. But, you know, I don't have a lot of power now, so... I'll accrue some more power, get a better status, and mm. then things will change. Wow. I mean, these are the kinds of questions that we're talking about um, all the time, and they are essentially questions of character. Mm. They're a question of desire. Uh, they're a question of like what what you want and what kind of person you are. Uh, I, I will just say um, also. Look, I, I think um, I don't need to tell you all about the level of. Uh, uh, distrust in institutions broadly. I mean, John has been the principal, one of the principal chroniclers of this, but in governmental institutions, in media, um, th there was, I think, a Gallup, I think it was Gallup poll in the last few months that showed only 21% of Americans believe elected officials run for office in order to serve their community. I think something like 48% said to serve their own self-interest. But what I've been trying to argue to a whole range of civic leaders, philanthropy, civic philanthropy, elected officials, journalists, is um, like I don't think ethical will do it. Like just acting ethically is not going to be enough to correct the crisis. Um, I, I think that the deep corrosion we're seeing in our public life now re requires something more akin to sacrifice. Mm. Like something, something more akin. Um, to 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 mm -hmm. displays and actions that are so contrary to the sort of spirit of the age um, that it has the potential to reset the public's expectations. So, so like you know, I try to um, like the public does not think that in media or government or the church, for instance, there are just some bad apples. They think the whole system is corrupt. When that happens, like people want, you know, what, how are, you know, how is Donald Trump getting, well, it's just really important to understand that large numbers of Americans believe Donald Trump is not uh, exceptional for his bad behavior, but that he's exceptional just for telling them the truth about it. And if you don't, it, like if we don't understand that, that Donald Trump is actually sort of acting as a confirmation of people's low expectations for all public servants, mm. and right, the idea of public service itself is again, just sort of outside of the imagination of many people. Um, 
and so 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 yeah, it takes. And I mean, just to, that's when we started the Center for Christianity and Public Life, we did not think just working in the area of ideas and thoughts and intellectual resources was up to the task. So I, I, I don't. Uh, uh, I remember, and I've been a part of, and I think they're wonderful things. All these conversations about, you know, there are these efforts where people will say, and, and Josh, I know you've like heard, heard of these, and we've probably been signers on some of them together. And so I think they're they're fine efforts, but you know, this idea that wow, it seems like civility is declining, and so let's get together all of our sort of influential friends and do a signing statement about how important civility is, and that'll take care of it. Mm. And what I try to explain to folks is, no, the American people know what civility is. They just don't think it's viable in public life. They don't think it works. And again, not to be too partisan um, here, but Donald Trump goes into churches and tells them, hey, I know Jesus has this love, love your enemies teaching. If you try that in politics, you'll be steamrolled. It, it, it doesn't work. At least not in politics. In your personal life, try it. I don't care. Whatever. That's your personal life. But in politics, you'll get run over. And so let me take care of you in politics. Um, well, that's a question of moral knowledge. Yep. All right. Let's flip to you guys, uh, starting with Tyler Whetstone from Knoxville, Tennessee. Tennessee and Knox News. Thank you, guys. Um, good it's kind of on and okay. off. Okay, good. One more time. Perfect. Tap, tap it and see if it makes a noise. The, the mic, actually. No big deal. Just, just, just talk. No, I'll, we're I'll just talk. friends. Um, thank you guys for, for this discussion. I think these types of discussions are the reason we go to these types of conferences. Um, John, I, this is for both of you. This kind of rips off John's question. And, and I'm more interested in the answer as it pertains to local, to hyper local, because that's what I do. That's my bread and butter. Um, I'm wondering how do you get, how do you find consensus on moral authority yeah. when religi religiosity yeah. and everything is so declining so quickly when you're talking about the hyper local things like immigration in the South or criminal justice or housing shortages and like getting your arms around things that are thorny. Like there's distrust everywhere like you just talked about. How, where do we find the moral authority on, on that? Yeah. So uh, I, I don't think we need to aim in public discourse to settle the question of who, what is the moral authority. That's not what I'm calling for. I have high degree of skepticism that that is, that that is possible in the public sense. I have a high degree of skepticism that it's a, a possible or, or a wise when it comes to public institutions. Again, I, I believe the separation of church and state as a legal principle and as an institutional principle should be zealously upheld, particularly when it comes to government. I, I think, I think what, what I am advocating for uh, is a consciousness of the moral dimensions of the decisions we're making and that we stop um, sort of in moments of convenience hiding the moral implications of our decision and hide behind the science says, data says. Um, no, that, that actually doesn't, that doesn't cover everything. We're, we're, we're making uh, moral knowledge is a is a is a reflection of the fact that we live in a moral universe. And so, if I had to give like a, a pithy answer on on uh, moral authority, I, I'd say the only the only authority that matters is reality. So, like, test, try mm -hmm. it. Like, d does it work? Does anger work? And 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 what does work mean mean for you? Like, what again? What are you trying to accomplish with anger? Like so, yeah. Anger works. Um, uh, if if your view is to uh, spike donations to your political campaign, then yeah, anger works. But then that that's question of well, uh, is that the moral objective? 
And how long does that work for? Might we be in the very midst of a crisis about what happens when you systemically and methodically cultivate uh, anger for your own purposes uh, and then see it spin out of control as, as the cultivation of anger always does? Faith Pinot from Los Angeles Times. Good morning. Thanks Hi. for being here. Um, I'm really grappling with with what you're saying about separating, and I think I'm understanding you correctly, like separating like philosophical separation of church and state and then legal separation of church and state. And I guess one, I would kind of push back on you that we aren't doing the philosophical separation of church and state because I think a lot of the issues um, that the U.S. is dealing with right now are fundamentally moral issues. Like I think the war in Gaza and Israel can be seen as a moral issue. Climate change can be seen as a moral issue. Um, the LGBTQ rights, right? Like there, a lot of these things I think actually come down to morals. Um, so I guess that's just like a thought that I'm, I'm grappling with here and I'd love to hear what you think. But I guess my question is uh, like, are, it sounds nice to have like, do separate legally church and state but please embrace philosophically, that seems a lot to ask, especially from um, your average religious, you know, churchgoer, synagogue goer. Like I'm thinking of, I, I mean, I report on separation of church and state quite frequently and talk to a lot of people in churches who like, it is all one and the same and they bring their morals to the ballot box. And, you know, I think I just don't know what that would look like to ask them to do that legally. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, so a couple clarifications. So the, the philosophical legal uh, uh, distinction applies specifically to separation of church and state, not moral knowledge. So, I mean, I, I, um, as I just said, I think our public square, our politics is full of moral assertion. So I, I'd, ag I, I'd agree. That's actually um, why I think sort of conversations about relativism are outdated because so many of our political debates are, ex are explicitly about morality, people's conception of, of what is moral. So that, that, would be the, that would be the first thing. The second thing is, um, I really like former President Obama's language of a practical absurdity, which is exactly the, so right, we can make these demands or sort of act as if people aren't bringing their moral or even religious views to politics. But it's, in, in practice, it's not happening because it can't happen. Like people are who they are. But, but uh, the, the sort of um, niceties of the insistence that that is what people must do, that they must somehow, I mean, that's how you get into people saying, well, no, I don't support this because my religious faith says so. I just also happen to think it's the right thing to, <laughs> you know, like you, you force people to get into all of these sort of uh, uh, games that, by the way, it doesn't seem like, and, and right, I mean, this is part of the philosophical power of the separation of church and state. It doesn't seem like any other source of knowledge, any other sort of a claim of authority has to make that two-step. So like, um, uh, it, it, the, you, whatever your sort of background is, your professional expertise, it's only the theologian, you know, hypothetically for the sake of, only the theologian who has to somehow uh, divert or sort of um, come up with a new um, source for what they believe in our public discourse. But, but if, you're, if you're a doctor, you can participate in politics with the authority of being a doctor. So, so like we get into all of these weird sort of, sort of games that don't reflect, don't reflect what's actually happening. And because of that, I think it's, well, it, it has created uh, both this thing where we clearly have people acting on some sense of uh, religious motivation, although I think Michelle Margolis's work at UPenn is very helpful in understanding uh, how um, she's argued quite compellingly that it's actually partisan identity that's um, driving religious affiliation as opposed to the other way around, but that's a, that's a whole other thing. Um, uh, uh, we end up in this place where you have people clearly acting on religious background, political therapeutic deism, uh, uh, while we're saying that that isn't happening at all. <laughs> and that, that, that ends in a really frustrating, 
frustrating place. Uh, because then you have Christians who are saying things like, um, uh, you know, politics is corrupt. I'm just participating in politics, like a, as opposed to holding their feet to the fire and, and a lot saying, no, actually, you are you. You are bringing your whole person to politics. Politics is not this whole other area of life that is cordoned off from God. Let's have a conversation about who you are when you show up in politics. I think it's also just important to remember the First Amendment uh, you know, pro prohibits the establishment of a religion, which is a top-down imposition from the government of a religious point of view. It also protects the free exercise of religion you know, in your private spaces. And a lot of the, the conflict comes about how much we can bring the principles, the values, the beliefs from that private sphere into the way that we approach policy making. Uh, and the further up the, the ladder of authority you get, the more that that question becomes a question of, are you beginning to encroach on a top-down imposition of your values, right? Um, uh, so anyway, I, I just think, you know, our, our system protects like that bottom up uh, pr product of, of our values and our faiths coming into the process. It also pro pr pr uh, prohibits a top down imposition and it's that middle ground, right, that, that is constantly being negotiated. That's good. Let's go next to Hafsa uh, Qureshi from WBUR NPR before that. Great. Um, actually, touching on what you were just saying, so according to the data, the amount of people who identify as religious in America is declining as a whole, yes. as Tyler mentioned. And the majority of folks who consider themselves religious tend to lean or tend to identify as Republicans, mm -hmm. according to the data. Do you think there's a reason why Democrats, Democrats tend to be less religious? Like, do, do you think that they think that religion doesn't have a role in politics? Or is it just a wider commentary of the values that they share uh, being reflected in the Democratic Party? Um, and you mentioned Michelle Margolis, who makes the case that political identity is the causal factor, primary causal factor, yeah. in determining Americans' religious identity more so than the other way around. Yeah. And I'm wondering what your thoughts on that were. Yeah. I mean, so I've been convinced by, by her argument, which is hmm. not to say um, that religious arguments and culture don't have a don't have an effect or shouldn't be tended to but but um, I think that the the dominant cultural uh, the, the dominant causal argument that she makes is, is 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 valid and that is that partisan identity drives religious affiliation is that yeah and so right so it, it, we, we've come up with all of these uh, sort of interesting uh, uh, Ryan Bird recently pointed out there's a the phenomenon of uh, um, conservative Republican identifying Muslims identifying in surveys as evangelical uh, because it's viewed as a political identifier. Um, it, that's not uh, that's not there's not like a craze happening, but it is just sort of like a uh, interesting blip in the data that suggests sort of uh, more more broadly what's what's happening. Um, Can you repeat the first part of your question? Yeah. Yeah. The so, re religious decline and. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, the amount of people who identify as religious in America is declining, and the people who do identify as religious, yeah. Repu they yeah, tend the God to gap. be yeah. identify as Republicans. Oh, sorry. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, so, right. I mean, race plays a significant role, uh, you know, and, and the. Um, uh, the, the, the racial composition of the political parties. So almost all of the God gap, uh, politically speaking, is basically constituted of the fact that um, uh, Democrats uh, have uh, the vast majority of white non-religious sort of, sort of voters in, in, their, in their party, although I think that we're seeing some shifts, some, some shifts there. Um, I do think there's a history of um, uh, the way the parties have engaged in religion. I will say as someone, I mean, this has been my chief line of work for the last 16, 17 years. I think that all of that is very much in shift right now. I, I, think, it's, I think it's very, I think it's plausible that 10 to 15, and not for any sort of, mostly as a, as, as a matter of demographics, 
I, I, I think that um, the, the gap gap uh, may be significantly narrowed, um, both because of a rising non-religious uh, portion of the Republican Party, but then also because of um, generating demographics in the Democratic Party. And so, um, and so, yeah, I mean, we could have a long conversation about all of the reasons uh, for that, the fact that Republicans were uh, have a long built up institutional support for faith outreach, while Democrats only decide uh, every six months before a presidential election to do faith outreach. Um, uh, the story of my life. Uh, um, but yeah, so there's a lot we could say, but I'll, I'll, I'll keep my answer there for now. Yeah. But I would love to discuss that with you later. Perfect. Great. You yeah. want to touch that one too, John? Religious right? Nope, I'm good. 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 Harvest Prude from Christianity Today. Previous to the dispatch. Hi, Hi, good to see you all. Um, my question is actually somewhat similar, which is that, you know, we talked about the distrust in media and government, but I would say the distrust also seems to go both ways yes. um, when it comes to an increasingly non religious public seeing the role of religion in politics. Yes. Um, and like you were saying, the the increasing numbers of people who we do not theologically think of as evangelical, identifying yeah. as the, the, uh, as evangelical, um, and it being seen more as a certain political identity, I'm just wondering if the appetite for faith in the public square is souring among, I guess, the body politic more broadly. Uh, yes, yes it is. There is a, there's a survey question that's been asked for a, a long time, uh, and about 15, 20, up until about 15, 20 years ago, it was an 80-20 question. That's, uh, do you believe that religion, religion broadly, is part of the solution to America's problems or part of the problem itself? And up until 15, 20 years ago, again, about 80% of Americans would say it's part of the solution. Now, of course, they'd all disagree on exactly how it's part of the solution, um, but there was this general sentiment that if we had more religion and better religion, uh, it would help address America's problems. That is now essentially a 50-50 question. Um, I think this has profound implications for our politics. More importantly, although not unrelated, just questions of social cohesion. Right? So, so what, what happens when you have a society where at least a strong minority view as one of their primary identities the fact that they're religious? And let's say the trend continues in 10, 15 years from now, you have a clear majority of Americans who say religion is part of the problem, not part of the solution. Um, that does not bode well for all the talk we're doing about bridge building, pluralism, all the efforts, the billions of dollars being spent. Like, like that, that is a serious um, development that, I mean, I'll, um, the Center for Christianity and Public Life uh, is, is very much wants to see that. I mean, right, it's no, it's no mistake. We, we, we try to frame things uh, positively, um, uh, but our mission is to contend for the credibility of Christian resources in public life for the public good. Like, there, there's another way of saying that, which is uh, the, the, the public really doubts right now whether Christian resources are oriented towards their good right. or whether Christianity is just another trade association mm. that's trying to amass power and, and uh, leverage it for their own self-interest. And if that doesn't change, again, the implications, not just politically, but, but so, like social fabric of the nation are, are really profound. And, and I just say, like, as I, I, my, my personal story is I, I came to faith as a 15-year-old, and it was very much a, not just a theological sort of development, um, but I was asking civic and social questions. Um, and so part of my personal story is understanding that, uh, like, so I came to faith at the height of the Bush years um, when the conversation about Christianity and public life wasn't all that dissimilar from what we have today. This, this idea that this is like the first time when there have been concerns about uh, a theocracy. Um, no, this is almost, this is very much a replay of, of what, where things sat 2003, 2004. Um, 
so it's not just the public and the social, but I know that there are people wrestling with their own personal faith and seeing, like, it, maybe the public is, like, on to something. Maybe the fact that whenever I tell someone that I'm a Christian, they go, oh, so you, you, you don't like me, or, or you think you're better than everybody, or, like, all, all this kind of thing. Like, like, maybe that suggests something about the truth of the faith. Um, so it's, it's troubling from a sort of missional perspective as well. All right, we'll touch church just there. Uh, so uh, let's go next to Brianna Frank. Now we got four more questions. Let's get them all in, okay? Uh, Brianna Frank from USA Today. Thank you so much for this. Um, it sort of touches on, on what we were just talking about. Um, but I wanted to go back to what you were saying earlier about um, the corrosion in public life and how your, your view that that requires sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious to know what your thoughts are on what that would look like in our respective jobs. Does it go back to what you were saying earlier about, for example, how you treat sources? Um, or you know, what are some, you know, some other examples of, of how we could um, display that and mm. also, um, sort of have an ethic of service, you know, like think of what we do as, as serving the public um, and, ha and have the public, you know, see what we do as a service. Um, what, are, what are some ways that we could work toward that? Yeah. That could be a John question too. D yeah, yeah, do you want to? Um, you know, I, I just, I, I, why don't you go first if you want, mm. and, and let me think about what I Yeah, I mean, I'll be brief. I mean, first I'd just say, like, I'd love to be in conversation with you all about what that could look like. Um, um, look, I, I, I think um, there, there's, a, there's a phrase in Scripture, uh, bearing another's burdens. This is coming kind of from Galatians, and, and Paul is saying... Um, that sort of without regard to status, there, there's a call to bear the burdens of another that aren't your own burdens. And I see that as in part as sort of the height of the journalistic calling to sort of tell stories that and, and, and lift up needs and tell the truth um, even uh, and, and maybe especially when it doesn't have to do with your own self-advancement. And so, like, w what are the ways that, that that is, that you're doing that day in and, and day out? Um, I, I think I'll, I'll stop there. There's, I, again, I would love to talk with you after about that. But I just was reflecting on the fact that I just love that question. I love the... Uh, the instinct there, and uh, Brianna and I were talking last night over over dinner. Uh, she comes. I uh, hope you don't mind me sharing that you come from a, a pretty conservative background. Uh, I come from a very conservative background, um, and I just it just kind of strikes me that there is something uh, noteworthy about the uh, the personal character instincts of a lot of conservative. Uh, religious folks. I've made a lot of criticisms about evangelicalism, specifically about how it trains people to be public citizens and how to act out their faith in public life. But I've also maintained that there's just a lot of really good people in conservative religious communities uh, who are being ill-served by a lot of the, the, the training that they're getting about how to take that faith out into public life. I think that question reflects that. I actually think uh, you know, Mike Pence's decision on January 6th reflects an incredible amount of personal character uh, and, and, uh, and personal faith. I think uh, Speaker Johnson's decision on Ukraine right now is another example of that. You can criticize these guys up and down and be totally uh, right to do so on a lot of things, but when push comes to shove, there is a moral uh, solidness, which is not a very good uh, turn of phrase, but it's just been striking me recently. Um, when it comes to sacrifice, uh, I kind of feel like Michael is talking about leadership that does things uh, that puts the public good ahead of one side's short-term wins. And I think <laughs> the incentives are really bad for that. And I think 
what you're doing with CCPL is one way of trying to train a new generation of leaders who think that way. Yeah, there are a couple little groups around town too that will meet by Zoom once every two weeks, once every week in some cases. There's a guy who's at a church downtown and he hosts a lunch group on Sundays. As well. And the idea of sitting with just other journalists, four of them, seven of them, six of them, you know, uh, to just compare notes about what's going on this past week, you know, is its own, its own, you know, idea. I don't, we have very modest expectations with faith angle gatherings. We don't expect such things to come out of a, of a conference, but who knows? You could, you know, two, two or, groups of two or three where you compare notes, you know, once every two weeks, yeah, yeah. and they're all journalists. That makes a, a bit of a difference. Yeah. Uh, let's go next to Jocelyn Hill from Box. Hi, thank you all so much for um, doing this. So the question I have, religion is very vast and diverse, and Christianity itself is very vast and diverse. I mean, you can have churches in the same denomination that will be very different politically in how yes. they do service, let alone denomination to denomination. I, I just think, you know, churches in the South, the white evangelical church is going to be very different from the black um, Protestant church two doors down. And I just wonder, what are the differences you're seeing within, you know, these different churches? And also kind of what are some of the common themes you're seeing? Because they're very different politically. And I do also wonder if where those similarities lie. So maybe common threads amongst congregations. And, and Reese, let's get yours as well. Uh, let's get two questions in if you can. Um, yeah, so just kind of I want to back up to like your political operative days. Yeah. Um, how do you see this happens in both political parties? I mean, yeah, politicians please. grapple with stances their party takes that are directly contrary to the religion, whether it be Biden on abortion, IVF, that's directly contrary to what the Catholic Church believes. Um, Republicans in Christianity, I mean, a lot, there's a lot of times like the love your enemy side, um, it's very aggressive. Um, I mean, how do you see behind the closed doors as a former political operative of people grappling with these stances that are really key to their party's position, whether it's Democrats and abortion, um, Republicans, and um, whether how they talk about immigrants or what have you in their religion when they're trying to take a certain stance. Yeah. Uh, I thought Peter Nichols had a great story for NBC News just this past weekend on Biden and abortion. Um, you know, different... I mean, they're all they're all individuals with with souls and their own sort of approach. So I don't think that there is sort of a a blanket sort of thing that can be said. I think some uh, folks take a more uh, transactional uh, approach than others. Um, there's certainly an um, an incentive structure supporting um, supporting a sort of culture of, of transaction and that sort of sincere engagement but but there there's there's wide wide diversity there um, l look I mean I think it's um, it, it's it's a um, it can be a, a, a difficult thing. And the, the, the slope of rationalizations that you can go toward, which is um, kind of like what we were discussing, sort of the, 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 the potential hypothetical like journalist rationalization, which is like, man, if, if, I, if I could just get one rung up the ladder, or if I could get three rungs up the ladder, then I'll be able to really be me. But but if but if 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 I if I'm honest about my stance on this issue or this set of issues now, I won't even have the chance to affect anything because I'll get my legs cut out from under me. And those are I I honestly don't think that there's enough reporting on uh, how political gatekeepers. Um, undermine sort of the democratic process through um, undercutting candidates who would, um, from ever even having the chance to run for election, to be represented, uh, uh, to, 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 to be taken seriously by voters. I mean, I think it's a real problem. And again, one of the sources of, of this sort of estrangement and dissatisfaction that people have. Do you think that's their role? 
should be their role. These religious leaders should be the role to, like, yeah, he said, like, sometimes they undermine politicians without having a chance to run. Should that be oh, no, 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 I'm sorry. I was talking about political gatekeepers. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. Political, uh, political gatekeepers. And and maybe this is a way to. Yeah, exactly. Too. And I was just going to connect yeah. it to to your. Um, here's here's the here's the trend that cuts through many many denominations, which is what I am seeing fade out is this idea that politics can be kept outside the four walls of the church. Um, uh, they're um, kept inside. I think you said outside. Maybe I misheard you. No, kept outside. outside. Just now it's kept in. outside. Coming in. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I, it used, I, to, be, it used I was, to be that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I just think that's it. The black church has just been so yeah, no, I'm, like I'm about, in the ordinance. Yeah. 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 Just, uh, so, so uh, I, I think that there is, um, the, 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 the black church's experience of politics, I think, is become, becoming more of a center of gravity. Mm -hmm. the, the sort of understanding that uh, politics produces, well, two things, right? Political decisions affect the lives of people in the, in the local church, but also in the communities in which they serve. So if you're detached and removed from political decisions, you're in some ways detached and removed from the life of the community you're trying to serve. And then more sort of uh, uh, philosophically um, uh, is, is this, um, you know, politics produces culture. And so if you, if you aren't connecting the general teachings of the faith to our political and public life, you are leaving people, and this is maybe a good way, I mean, this is what my book is about, which is that if, um, if we are leaving out the public and social aspects of formation, we are, we are making discipleship, formation into Christ-likeness, catechesis, whatever sort of terminology you want to make, we're making it um, uh, 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 incomprehensible. We're, we're actually, we're actually um, negating at the outset the possibility of being an integrated person if you leave out the social and political. That is becoming what now, right? Now, the ways in which different church communities are coming to grapple with this realization uh, is very different, but that is a through line I'm seeing develop. And just to like put a fight, right? I, I think 15 years ago, if you were like a, um, a well-meaning, like centrist pastor, you, well, yeah, the way that you avoid the mistakes of uh, like an overly politicized faith is to say, like, we don't talk about politics here. Right. It's a politics-free zone. Well, in the last uh, a decade, 15 years, it's become really apparent that, no, when you do that, you're not keeping politics out. You're just leaving a vacuum. You're just leaving a vacuum in which other teachers, other authorities, other sources are actually taken to be um, relevant. Mm -hmm. And so you have, I mean, this is, uh, I forget who reported on, I think Bob Smitana, maybe it was Jack, I think this was in RNS, but you know, I found it, and I'll, I'll close just with this. Um, it, it was really fascinating to me, not to bring it back to sort of evangelicals, but there was a political question, so kind of to bring it back to your, your question as well. Like the whole idea of the religious right was, hey, there's not enough, um, like we represent a ton of people, we should be calling the shot, we have convening power, politicians should come to us. And so there were all these cattle call events of politicians coming to speak to pastor so-and-so and, and answer the questions that churches had. Really interesting. Bob Vanderplatz in Iowa, um, they had the opportunity to bring in all the Republican candidates, but it wasn't a pastor asking the questions. It was Tucker Carlson, which shows a really interesting inversion of authority and who has it, who do Christians, at least one set of Christians, who do they trust? 
when it comes to political knowledge. Mm -hmm. And this sort of summarizes our whole conversation, right? If, 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 uh, if Christianity, if religious sources of knowledge can't be taken seriously in political life, then Christians as a demographic, religious groups as a demographic, become just a, uh, uh, an audience for other sources of authority to come in and sort of steer that demographic and influence that demographic, actually absent religious authority um, in, a, in a really perverse way. Can I ask practically, uh, how many of you have checked out of the hotel already? Uh, as long as you, if your bag's down here, that's what I really mean. Yeah. All right. So um, I think it's wisest then to let Tamara uh, from The Economist find you guys uh, as, we, as we break, OK? Um, Great. And let's take the next 25 minutes to check out uh, completely. We'll resume in here at 11 o'clock sharp with, uh, if we've had a, a session that's, that's weighted into morality and the religion of things, the formation of things and, and politics, the next session is going to be very practical. It's about some stories from the newsroom, from the writer's workshop, and you're going to enjoy both those speakers. So in here at 11 o'clock sharp, please check out if you would, and we'll see you at 11. Thanks, guys. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Michael. Appreciate it.